It's nine o'clock, we're gonna get started. I am Dr. Teresa McKenzie. I am the Accessibility Coordinator at Ohio University Southern. Um, I'd like to introduce you to our Associate Dean, Dr. Solomon Naromale. All right, uh, thank you very much, Teresa. Um, good morning again. Uh, my name is Solomon Naromale and I'm the Associate Dean of the Ohio University Southern Campus. So uh, on behalf of the whole university, I'd like to welcome you to our sixth annual Envision Access Conference. And first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. McKinsey and all the people who worked to put this uh, conference together, uh, especially for persisting when it looked like we may not have this conference this year. So. Um, uh, kudos to you for, for, for assisting and uh, making this happen this morning. So thank you. Uh, I'm really excited about the topic um, of today's sessions. Uh, the first one on creating an inclusive work environment for employees with invisible disabilities. And then the second one on perspectives of college freshman students with disabilities. Um, I think that these are relevant topics for any time in history, but I think they're particularly timely today, considering the challenges that, you know, educational institutions, both uh, universities, as well as our K through 12 uh, great institutions are facing and society in general. So my hope today is that, you know, through the presentations and through the conversations that we begin to reflect on ways that we can support uh, everybody uh, in society uh, with the challenges that we're facing, uh, both the abilities and the disabilities, and also have um, acquired new tools you know, for our toolbox to enable us to continue to do the work that we do. So uh, it's really an honor to be here uh, this morning and to see all the participants here. So um, I hope you have a really good day. So thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Nomale. Thank you. Again, good morning, everyone. It is my honor to get our first session started. Um, I am the moderator for this session. Today, we are going to meet Dr. Josephine Bennett. The session title is, It's Not Magic, Creating an Inclusive Work Environment for Employees with Invisible Disabilities. Uh, I am the Veteran Services and Accessibility Coordinator here at Ohio University. I'm also the chair of the Envision Access Conference Planning Committee. I'll be your moderator for this session. But before we get started, I want to take time to thank the staff of Deaf Services Center in Portsmouth, Megan and Christy, who will be our interpreters for today's sessions. Um, you will see them throughout. So again, thank you both of you for coming and doing this today. Your, your presenter this morning is Dr. Josephine Bennett. Dr. Josephine Bennett is an experienced adjudicator who has worked performing vocational analyses, disability assessments, and preliminary hearing evaluation for both state and federal governments. For over a decade, Dr. Bennett has worked to understand the physiological and psychological factors that impact sustainability, sustainable employment for individuals with disabilities. This includes understanding barriers that prevent individuals from entering the workforce, as well as assessing functional capacity and limitations in the presence of certain medical and psychiatric conditions. She also works as the Assistant Director of HR Data and HR Advisor for uh, Everett advisory, partner, advisory Partners, which is a consulting firm designed to help address and resolve workplace challenges across numerous industries. Dr. Bennett obtained her Doctor of Business Administration degree in Human Resources from Liberty University, her MBA from the University of North Alabama, and her Bachelor's of Science in Business Management from Jacksonville State University. She also possesses certifications in SPSS, SAS, and Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Her skills in quantitative analysis have given her the opportunity to aid organizations and individuals with leveraging data to provide valuable insights into the decision-making process. Dr. Bennett also utilizes her data analysis expertise to assist doctoral students across the country with data analysis and navigating their dissertation process. So thank you, and without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Bennett. Thank you so much for uh, that introduction, Dr. McKenzie. <clears throat> I appreciate it. And I'm really excited to be here uh, at the Envision Access, the sixth annual Envision Access Conference. And I, I really wanted to be able to share uh, through my experience 
And this is really on both sides and understanding uh, what prevents individuals from entering the workforce, as well as understanding how they function uh, within certain roles or on their jobs uh, in the presence of certain disabilities. So I'm excited to be able to share that. And uh, I'm, I'll actually will go ahead and get into uh, the presentation that I have today. I will have the opportunity for uh, questions. If you have any questions at the end or need any uh, specific information, I am always an open book and willing to share. And so I will, uh, I'll start my presentation. And let's see. Okay, <clears throat> and so as she mentioned, the uh, the topic <clears throat> of the session is it's not magic creating inclusive work environments for individuals or employees with invisible disabilities. Now, I would like to uh, start the session off with um, basically just talking about what are uh, disabilities. Now, according to uh, the CDC or uh, Center for uh, Disease Control, uh, disability affects approximately 61 million or nearly one in four people in the United States. And this, this actually uh, shows that disability affects more than one billion people worldwide. Now, just think about that, one million people. The, uh, the Center for Disease Control, they actually define disability as a condition of the body or the mind that makes it more difficult for the person with the condition to do certain activities or interact with the world around them. Now, when we're looking at uh, disabilities or what are disabilities, there are really three dimensions of disability uh, that we'll look at. And this is based on information from the World Health Organization. And those three dimensions are impairment, activity limitation, and participation restrictions. And when we say impairment, we're looking at really a loss of function or ability. And these can either be structural or functional. But uh, looking at a disability, the disability exists because there is some type of impaired ability relative to the usual standard of an individual or group. Now, when we say disability, uh, we're looking at generally four types of disabilities. We have physical, we have intellectual, we have mental, and we have sensory. And when, when we say physical disabilities, uh, these are the disabilities that affects an individual's physical capacity or their mobility. And a, an example of these might be amputations, uh, cerebral palsy, spinal cord injuries or muscular dystrophy. Now these uh, generally fall within the musculoskeletal and the neurological systems. Now the second type of disability uh, we have is intellectual. Intellectual disabilities are usually determined based on an individual's intellectual capacity as established by IQ testing. And generally these are individuals with IQ scores at or, or below 70. Uh, and these are the individuals that are considered to have intellectual disabilities. Now, some of the, um, some of the uh, diagnoses for individuals with intellectual disabilities are uh, maybe Down syndrome or fetal alcohol syndrome or autism. Now, the third type of disability uh, that we're, we're looking at is mental or mental disabilities. And these disabilities generally affect how an individual thinks, how they feel, how they behave and how they interact with the people around them. Now, examples of mental uh, disabilities include anxiety, depression, 
schizophrenia, PTSD, or certain personality disorders. Now, uh, the final disability uh, that we uh, want to take a look at are sensory disabilities. And sensory disabilities are disabilities that affect the senses. And these are impairments uh, that may affect the individual's ability to see, their ability to hear, their ability to smell, their ability to taste. Now, an example of these might be hearing loss, vision loss, or other sensory processing disorders. Now, um, in understanding what disabilities are, let's take a look specifically at what invisible disabilities are. Of course, as you can see, we have a wide range of disabilities can, that can exist within the workplace. But our focus today is going to be on invisible disabilities. So what exactly is an invisible disability? Invisible disabilities are conditions that can't be seen from the outside, but it impacts the individual's movements, it impacts their senses, or it impacts their activities. Individuals with in, in, invisible disabilities, they can experience fatigue, pain, or mental disturbances. And in, in, invisible disabilities can exist within any of the disability categories that I mentioned before. Now, of course, <clears throat> if you were to, let's say, see someone in a wheelchair or using a cane or with a hearing aid, you might immediately think, hey, you know, this person has some type of disability. And for some, when we see individuals uh, with more visible disabilities, uh, we justify our actions, you know, maybe uh, we justify their, uh, their use of the handicap parking outside the grocery store, or uh, we may hold the elevator open for just a little bit longer. But what about those individuals uh, who have disabilities that can't be easily seen? Do they always receive the same treatment? The reality is, they don't. And oftentimes, um, it's, a, it's a challenge, and this is what we are discussing today. Now, an, an invisible disability can include, but it's not limited to, cognitive impairments, brain injuries, uh, autism, chronic illnesses like multiple sclerosis, chronic fatigue, chronic pain, fibromyalgia, deafness or hearing loss, low vision, anxiety, depression, PTSD, dyslexia, ADHD, diabetes, and Crohn's disease. And uh, one of the things about invisible disabilities is that oftentimes these are, uh, these may be individuals with uh, psychiatric disabilities, and they make up a large portion of the invisibly disabled population. Now, of course, uh, the main factor uh, that you're looking at when you're looking at invisible disabilities is that you're unable to see the disability. So this means that you may not be able to see the impact of the disability. And candidly, uh, the validity of the disability is not related to your ability to see it. Now, there are uh, things that we want to remember or to keep in mind uh, when understanding invisible disabilities. First is uh, when individuals have in invisible disabilities, there are no visible supports to indicate a disability such as canes or wheelchairs or the use of sign language. What we also can consider is that even though they are invisible, they can still wreak havoc on an individual's ability to carry out the tasks of their day-to-day -day life. Now, the disability may be managed through medication or behavior and these may be for impairments such as diabetes, asthma, epilepsy, or psychiatric disorders. Now, uh, the other thing that we need to remember is that in the workplace, it needs to be documented. And it needs to be documented to ensure that there are reasonable accommodations under ADA. 
Now, one other thing that we want to remember is that individuals may be experiencing some type of physical or emotional pain. And with this, it's important to keep in mind that as you develop ways to interact and respond uh, to individuals within the workforce, that they may have things going on that you just may not see. <clears throat> now, what is the importance of creating an inclusive work environment? For decades, people with disabilities have continued to push employers to follow both the letter and the spirit of the law uh, regarding disabilities in the, work, in the workplace. Because the reality is, is that people with all types of disabilities, they face adverse circumstances in the workplace. And even more so with invisible disabilities, as they may face a different type of discrimination than others, uh, for instance, being accused of imagining their symptoms or their symptoms not even being believed. Now, what's, entering, what's interesting to keep in mind is that employees who have disabilities, they don't and they can't shed the complexities of their physical and mental selves while they're at work. This is who they are. Now, in a 2017 study, uh, the Center for Talent Innovation, they identified that 30% of white collar college ed educated employees had a disability, but only 32% self identified as having a disability. So that's 32% of people uh, of the 30% who identified as having a disability. Now, 62% of the employees with disabilities had an invisible disability. Now, what this lets us know is that people go through their lives, including their work lives, not only not revealing that they have a disability, but also without revealing what they are experiencing and how it is impacting them. And with that, we are challenged to create work environments that eliminate the stigmas associated with disabilities. Now, what we, what we want to look at, uh, we want to look at really strategies that support inclusivity within the workplace. And that means uh, really taking a look at disability inclusion. Now, disability inclusion means that uh, we are seeking to understand the relationship between the way people function and how they participate in society and making sure that everybody has the same opportunity to participate in every aspect of life to the best of their ability and their desires. Now, a robust uh, disability inclusion program makes it easier for all employees to perform at their, at their highest potential. And when this is done, it promotes a culture that celebrates differences. It encourages employees to bring their whole selves uh, to work uh, something that most forward-thinking companies want for their employees. Now, disability inclusion, it reaches beyond just compliance with the law. What it means is that uh, you proactively support inclusivity within your organization. And this uh, proactive support, it has imp an important and meaningful impact on your employees, on your customers, and your communities. So the thing to keep in mind uh, with disability inclusion is that representation is key. And it is key in creating meaningful and genuine inclusion. And so what this says is that the staff and leadership within the organization has to include a diverse range of employees and perspectives. Now, including individuals uh, with disabilities in everyday activities and encouraging to have them to have roles that are similar to their peers who may not have a disability, that is what disability inclusion is. And so this involves more than just simply encouraging people. It requires ensuring that adequate policies and practices are in place that affect the community and the organization. Sorry. Now, um, what we want to look at as far as spe specific strategies in uh, creating 
uh, an inclusive workforce. Uh, these are things that, uh, that we just want to note and keep in mind. The first thing is that uh, we want to create an environment where employees feel comfortable with disclosing their identity status. And they, they feel more comfortable presenting their authentic selves when they know that they work in an inclusive environment. Now, the second thing is to review the accommodations that your organizations offer offers uh, for people with disabilities. Now, of course, ADA requires accommodations to be made in the workplace uh, for individuals with disabilities, but you want to ensure that you are creating a way for individuals with visible and invisible disabilities to perform their job at or above expected level. And you can't really say that you're creating an inclusive work environment without providing the appropriate accommodations. Number three, you want to ensure that your organization is offering support and services for people with disabilities. Now in offering support, this might include making sure that your mental health coverage is included in your company's uh, health plan. It might also include promoting free services that are a part of the employee benefit package. And it might include maybe uh, health coaching to help reduce stress. Number four, never assess an individual's disability based on what you see. Now, when you make an assessment of an individual's disability based on what you see, you've made a conclusion about the person when you have no idea what they may be experiencing or feeling. Number five, be open and proactive with requests. Now, as I mentioned earlier, ADA provides that uh, organizations have to provide accommodations, but the attitude that you take towards providing uh, or towards the request is up to you. Now, the goal should be to make it clear that if accommodations are needed, that you'll be happy to make that accommodation. And don't just say it, but mean it. And that means that you will fulfill the request within a reasonable amount of time. Number six, create signs or displays supporting invisible disabilities. Now, creating a sign or display that shows your support for invisible disability really acknowledges that you understand that disabilities come in all shapes and sizes. And number seven, provide staff training. And this, this is really ensuring that all members of your staff understand all types of disabilities. And the reality is, is that oftentimes the lack of understanding regarding disabilities can lead to damaging implications. Now, I did want to, uh, I want to just take a look at, at what an example, what examples of uh, what inclusive accommodations uh, for invisible disabilities might look like. So let's say if we had an individual, an individual with a chronic pain. Now, a person with a chronic pain condition, they may need a flexible start time or break time to take medication. They may need additional time to complete certain tasks, especially if they are experiencing some type of pain crisis. For anxiety, an individual with anxiety may need to limit their interactions with the public. They may need to work in settings uh, where they only interact with a few people. They may need flexibility in their arrival time at work, especially if they experience anxiety while driving learning disabilities. An employee who struggles with uh, maybe a working memory due to a learning disability, they could receive written instructions for their job duties instead of relying on verbal discussion. They may need complex instructions broken down into simpler instructions. PTSD, someone with PTSD might not be able uh, to work in environments that experiences frequently loud noises. Their accommodation may include avoidance of, of situations that are similar to or remind them of their trauma. Now, as with any disability, 
you want to ensure that the accommodation that you are providing is to enable the individual to perform at the same level or higher level than their counterpart without disabilities. Now, uh, this actually concludes my session for this morning, uh, and I, I wanted to open the floor if there are any questions or uh, any clarifications that uh, any of the attendees need, just feel free, uh, type it in the comments and let me know. Thank you, Dr. Bennett. Um, I do have a question. I actually mm -hmm. probably have several questions, but we'll start with the first one. So when you talk about invisible disabilities, I know um, there's a guidance that long COVID is now included as something that could be a, poten a potential disability, and it would be an invisible disability. Do you mm -hmm. know if um, employees, employment employers are taking the time to include that or having conversations about that? And how is that impacting how accommodations are applied in the workplace? Yes, uh, they are, and that's that's a really good question. But yes, and it's it's actually an area that is continuing to be de developed as some of uh, the what we call long haulers, uh, that some of their symptoms are still being realized. And uh, just in my experience, maybe what some of those what some of those uh, limitations or um, things may be within the within the workforce that that individuals may be experiencing is it may be problems related to their breathing or uh, fatigue. Some may experience tremors and, uh, you know, and a good portion of, of what they may be experienced, they may be invisible, uh, they may not be as visible. And as research is continuing to be conducted on what these uh, residuals are related to COVID. Yes, employers are, because COVID is an impairment. It is a, a, a condition that is considered a disability. And the residual effects of it, of it are, and employees have to uh, consider the impact of COVID and the residual symptoms within uh, their accommodation. So if they are providing accommodations and an employee expresses, you know, that they have residuals from COVID, the employers do have to accommodate. But like I said, it is, I don't want to say it's a long process, but as uh, research is still being conducted, they are still developing what these accommodations look like. And of course, you know, in your experience, experience with providing accommodations, a lot of times they rely on doctor statements, uh, information from the doctors, you know, on what these limitations might look like or what these accommodations might look like in the workforce. And so, yes, employee, they are, of course, in conjunction uh, with doctors or uh, with physicians and medical staff. Do you know if um, there is definitive um, criteria for determining long COVID versus someone who had COVID and they're still having symptoms two weeks, one month, three months out. Do you know if there is a definitive criteria or a time frame for a long COVID diagnosis? I, I have not come across it, but uh, in, in my role, and like I said, you know, um, or as you shared, I assess I make assessments for individuals with disabilities and for individuals with COVID, when we are evaluating, we're looking at, you know, what their current symptoms are. And when they have symptoms related to COVID, then we consider that, you know, as a long term until we have longitudinal evidence that shows otherwise, then we look at what those long term effects are. We look at what their current effects are and we just consider it long term until we have, like I said, additional evidence that shows otherwise. Okay, thank you. No problem. You're welcome. Are there other questions? No? Well, I have one. <laughs> I told you I had more than one. So you talk about creating uh, an environment, and you talk about a couple of things that you can do to create that environment, such as signage that shows support for invisible disabilities. What are other ways besides training and these things that employers can do to show um, support for individuals with those invisible disabilities? So um, one of the 
one area that I I, I, I like to talk about, but it's it's sometimes considered an abstract uh, concept is culture. What is the culture uh, that you are building around disability? And uh, when I say culture, what is the what are what's the environment that individuals with disabilities have to operate in? And so uh, I'll just provide an example. Let's say you have uh, an in individual that may um, that may be experiencing chronic pain. And in order to uh, avert those pain crises, they have to take medication at certain intervals. Well, as a part of as a part of the employment policy, this individual has to be at their desk or has to be at a certain location until their break. So they have to do, let's say maybe four hours at a time, but they need to, they need the opportunity to take a break every three hours. Now the attitude that you take towards this employee and providing that accommodation, that establishes basically the culture in which uh, you are establishing for individuals with disabilities or invisible disabilities, because you don't provide accommodations <clears throat> for this employee to take the medication to avoid the pain crises, then you are not basic, you're basically giving the impression that you're not accepting of individuals with disabilities that you can't see. And so <clears throat> I said all that to say is to create a culture that embraces uh, individuals with all types of disabilities and recognize that maybe these accommodations may not look like the accommodations that I'm used to perform or, or providing. And being open-minded about what those accommodations are. Now in my role, um, and I know that when most employers, they get letters or notes from doctors regarding you know, what those accommodations may be. But oftentimes in my role, I'm able to glimpse inside of records, medical records. And, you know, you see the complaints, the consistent complaints, how even medication sometimes doesn't control the impairments, but, you know, it gets to the employer and they are hesitant to uh, offer accommodations because they feel like, hey, you know, this may not be as bad as what the doctor is saying, but on my end, I'm, I'm looking in medical records and I see, hey, like, you know, when this person is experiencing pain, they are, you know, they, are, they have some pretty significant limitations in their ability to function. And so it's just really uh, understanding and creating that environment where individuals are able to, as I mentioned, present their best selves, you know, even if that means that we have to provide these extra opportunities for, for them to perform. Okay, just want to uh, make a little announcement. Um, there is a raised hand, raise hand uh, icon in the reactions if you want to raise your hand. You may also put any questions in chat or if you want to unmute yourself and ask your questions, please feel free to do that. And I think Karen has raised her hand and would like to ask a question. Go ahead, Karen. Thank you. And thank you, interpreters. Um, I'm one of those invisible disabilities, um, hard of hearing. And also, um, I can speak for myself, but I have other disabilities too. I'm going to drop my hands and let the interpreters do their job. Um, my question is regarding um, new hires. Mm -hmm and the accommodations um, that could be provided for new hires. Um, I'm speaking from my own personal experience as a new hire. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I would like to say that um, I was starting my, my job um, as an instructor um, the first day of class, <laughs> like, here you go. <laughs> um, and there's been some significant bumps along the way, um, bumps that I wouldn't have anticipated because you don't know until you're in the middle of it. I'd like to know what could be done for the next person who comes along to smooth those bumps. As I told my friends, I didn't have a learning curve. I had a learning cliff. Um, and um, I had to do some serious reflection as to whether I could continue. Right, okay. Um, 
and continue to have some difficulties. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is technology related um, mm -hmm. because I am entering the workforce. When I was in college, we didn't have Blackboard and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, and I'm wondering what could be done for new hires to ease that transition if they're re-entering the workforce, um, if they're doing a job exploration. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to suppose that if someone is in a job already and then a disability happens, they know their job, the environment, they know the people, and it might be a little bit of an easier accommodation process. Mm -hmm. But when you have a new person coming in to the unknown, it's kind of unknown on both ends. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that there could be ways to maybe make that a little easier. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd like to know, um, or at least make the suggestion that that be explored. Mm -hmm. Thank yes, you. you are absolutely correct. And one of the ways uh, in which that can be done is through education uh, and conferences such as this that really highlight uh, what uh, what is necessary, highlights those steps in uh, creating uh, inclusive environments. And this is pre-employment, during employment and post-employment. Now, uh, one of the the things that you mentioned or you provided your personal experience. Now, and this is a great way uh, in, in educating and just being able to share that because you know firsthand what it feels like, you know what the experience was like for you and you want to avoid that because that impacts the overall um, quality of life for individuals with disabilities. You know, when they enter into a work, workforce because uh, they want they want to, they want to be able to, you know, perform, individuals with disability want to be able to perform. And when there are hindrances to that process, uh, then that almost kind of adds to the complexities uh, yes. of the individual's life. So uh, part of it is being able to educate, share experiences uh, and shed light on what these experiences are. Uh, one of the uh, one of the things that I mentioned just kind of in um, that was actually mentioned in the uh, abstract for this conference was if you if you do a search for the hashtag invisible disability, you have so many stories of individuals uh, with different types of disabilities who have experienced such adverse situations uh, related to their disability. And this is uh, just in society. This is through their employers, uh, through um, onboarding and just through various uh, activities, they have experienced those adverse situations. And so just creating ways to educate uh, people about these disabilities and make, it the, make these conversations the norm so that you know, people are comfortable uh, with understanding or they, or they have a level of understanding as it relates to disabilities. Because generally uh, what I have found is that the, the, the organizations, individuals that struggle uh, with providing the appropriate accommod accommodations are the individuals who don't understand what those accommodations should look like they don't understand the nature of disability and it's just a matter of educating them. I would, um, I would beg to say that that might be a little bit of half the issue. Mm -hmm. um, I would suggest, for example, yes, education is definitely needed, but if someone is educated about how to make accommodations for person a mm -hmm. that doesn't help with person b right and what i'm asking what i'm i'm considering we have students that receive assistance mm -hmm. for for their needs mm -hmm. and i guess what i'm i'm suggesting maybe is some kind of a team or a partnership or an individual who is identified who is 
going to be someone that you could go to in mm -hmm. that moment or someone that you can bounce things off of who can then go to do the policy stuff mm -hmm. um, that the um that um and i'm not articulating this clearly because this is totally off the cuff but some kind of a a, a, a this you know it's this not partnership and you want someone to be able to advocate for individuals with disabilities or 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 someone who's your case manager so to speak right right that individual to assess that individual's needs because right. what that person's going to need is going to be different from as i said person b or person c right. mm -hmm. um as opposed to a blanket approach right and that's and that is absolutely that is true and one of the things that uh, even working in my role um in understanding disabilities, you know, there are some times where I encounter disabilities that I have never encountered before. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, wow, I may not know what the limitations, what limitations this individual may have. And so at that point, I start doing research. Mm -hmm. I start collecting data, collecting information about what type of hindrances this individual may have that would impact their ability to function in a work environment. And so, you know, and it's, it's just, and once I understand that, you know, then I can, I can create a profile. Okay. Well, an individual that may have this type of disability, uh, these, this may be what they experience, but sometimes, you know, when you encounter maybe something that you haven't encountered before, mm -hmm. you know, and this, it's not creating a blanket approach, but it's just um, when you're presented with the opportunity to address it, then you can address it at that time. But uh, you know, until you have maybe experienced it, that you just may not have that, you may not have the ability or the knowledge to, to be able to address it in the way that it needs to be addressed, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'd like to kind of jump on her question um, to ask another question. So mm -hmm. I understand what she's saying, but my question is, I kind of vaguely remember my hiring process and I don't think um, disability was asked. Mm -hmm. So how does an employer find a way to legally ask that question so that her experience doesn't get repeated? Um, right. Because I don't, again, I don't remember being asked that question if I had a disability. I mean, I know later on, um, I was given a ch choice to voluntarily share that after I was through the onboarding process, but mm -hmm. how can employers build in something legally to find that out so that uh, future employees don't have the same experience that she had? Does that make right. sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. And so um, to ward off discrimination against uh, individuals with disabilities, mm -hmm. Uh, certain questions cannot be asked, it cannot be required as a part mm -hmm. of the application process. Mm -hmm. But now you can you can voluntarily provide that information and you I don't know you know how long it's been if, since you've done a job application, but there's a, a volunteer or self-report uh, aspect mm -hmm. of it where the information is actually provided to the federal government. Now for individuals who may work on federal contracts or who have a certain number of employees, they have to you know, provide whatever information is collected to ensure that they're uh, not participating in discriminatory practices in their hiring. But you can self-report it, but also um, it is from the employee perspective, uh, I always advocate for employee surveys. And this is, um, where employees are able to anonymously provide information, you know, and one of the one of the uh, things that can be addressed is is you know you can ask and and they can you know have the ability to opt out or not provide it, but you can ask, do you have a disability? Do you feel that our company or our organization? Um, could appropriately accommodate your disability. One of the things that you know I shared in the presentation is that a lot of people with disabilities, they don't, they don't share it. If they don't have to, they won't, but it's because of the stigmas that are associated with disabilities. And it is because they the, the way that they may feel like they will be treated or the response to it, so they don't share. 
And that is the importance of creating an inclusive work environment, creating an environment where um, individuals with disabilities are comfortable with talking about it that you don't have to, you know, maybe see them experience their disability in order for you to embrace individuals with disabilities. And it's just, like I said, creating, uh, creating a culture or a safe place for individuals with disability, for ver with various disabilities, uh, to just be able to um, talk about it, to be able to share it openly uh, without fear of retaliation, or uh, without fear that, you know, that they would have to experience some type of negative comment or just some type of negative response from the organizational leadership or their coworkers, jokes that, uh, that you know, may not be appropriate related to their disability. So it's just um, making it the norm, making those conversations, sharing information about disabilities so that those conversations can happen and that um, individuals don't feel the negative effects of talking about disability. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions, comments? I would like to just add, I think that the conversations are important. The question is, then what do you do with them? Mm -hmm. One, uh, <laughs> and I've shared sorry, this. I, I'm, I'm sorry. No, it, it is okay. Like I, like, I love talking about it and I love talking about it because these conversations make it the norm. It, it makes it easy to talk about you and you really have to just kind of work through the difficult aspects of the conversation, the uneasiness, the uncomfortableness, whatever. You work through it so that it becomes easy. So I, it is no problem at all. I understand. And you, you know, you are, you're speaking from, from a perspective of someone who has experienced this, you know, what it feels like, and, and you know, you're, you don't like what it feels like to you and you want to prevent that for the next person. And so that is certainly understandable. Uh, and so I'm sorry, can you, I went off. <laughs> can you <laughs> basically what you get the conversation happening right. and then what? Okay. What happens with that information? <laughs> yes, and so that is um, one of the one another workshop that I uh, do. It's a DEI workshop, but it's about collecting data and it's about mm -hmm. collecting information uh, about diversity, equity, inclusion. You know, whatever aspect, collecting that information, but also using the information to uh, create a plan for implementation. So the conversations are not just taking place, or they shouldn't just take place just to take place. Uh, mm -hmm. This is an opportunity for employers. It's an opportunity for uh, whoever, you know, finds usefulness in the information. It's, it's an opportunity for them to collect data, for them to collect information, specific experiences, and to collect it and to develop solutions. And it's not just about, um, you know, creating an infographic or, uh, you know, just saying, hey, you know, we do this, but creating measurable outcomes. Mm -hmm. You know, we want individuals within our workforce, within our organization to feel included. Let's, let's get their perspective, you know, the surveys that I mentioned earlier. Okay, so they don't, how can we ensure that we are creating an inclusive work environment, develop solutions, implement it, and then come back and measure it again. Mm. let's see if what we are implementing is being effective and if it's not okay well let's go back to the drawing board maybe to the solutions were not comprehensive enough mm -hmm. so maybe let's let's uh incorporate more people into the solution providing process individuals who may have certain experiences you know what type of solutions would they suggest and it's really i don't want to say it's trial and error but it, it's a process it doesn't happen overnight right it, and it doesn't happen based on, you know, one experience, it takes a lot of different perspectives in order to be able to provide viable solutions that are measurable, that are impactful. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yes, those conversations, but then move beyond the conversations and, and to implementing measurable programs, measurable, um, to get measurable results that ultimately uh, transforms the culture of the organization. If there's a way that I can help be involved, I'd really be interested. Awesome. That's the mindset to have. <laughs> that is the mindset. You do your part. And that's um, that's 
the, the mentality that I have towards it. Because, you know, I get to see firsthand, I get to really see behind the curtain on what individuals with disabilities experience. And oftentimes hearing their stories, uh, hearing them share their experiences of what, you know, they have experienced in the workforce, uh, how they have been terminated once their employer has found out they have a certain type of disability, how, you know, they didn't even make it past training because, you know, they found the employer found out and they terminated them. And of course, it's against the law for individuals to be uh, terminated for disabilities, but it happens. It happens. And it's just, it's really, uh, it's categorized under some other reasoning. But, um, but yeah, I get to see that firsthand. And my heart really goes out to individuals that, you know, have those experiences, because we want to, uh, we want individuals with disabilities. We want them to, you know, be their best selves. We want to, we, th- we want them to feel like their best selves. And so uh, that is important for me. <laughs> so, thank you. Uh, we have a hand raised. Um, go ahead and ask your question. You can unmute. Okay. Um, so I work in a career services um, department at at Shawnee. And I was wondering for for students with disabilities that need accommodations in the workplace, um, how can they best advocate for themselves? Is it if they're worried about retaliation, like during an interview, um, would they wait till they were like onboarded and then go to HR? Or what are, what is the, the the least risky way for them to get what they need right out of the gate? Mm-hmm. And so <laughs> it this. Inclusion is still a work in progress. And that's just being honest. It's still a work in progress. And it's because so many people don't understand disability inclusion. They don't understand disability accommodations. And, um, and like, as I mentioned earlier, you can, this is information that you can self-report. But if you choose not to, you know, that's certainly optional optional until you feel like you're at a comfortable place. And so uh, the place to go to receive the accommodations would be the HR or human resource department. Uh, And that is information that you should be able to share confidentially. Uh, And there are times where, depending on the nature of the accommodations, that it does have to be shared with the immediate supervisor. But um, the the area to receive the accommodations and to really advocate is through the human resource department. That's generally uh, where it takes place. Of course, some organizations don't have um, human resources departments, so to say, so to speak, but uh, that's generally where it takes place. And the goal is to one, provide documentation because you do want to, uh, when whatever accommodation is being requested, you do want to provide documentation on what those accommodations should be. And um, and I don't, it's, it's about just really being able to share, <laughs> share what those needs are and, um, with the organization, I want to make sure that I'm saying it properly, but just being able to to share and express, you know, hey, you know, I want to be able to uh, perform this job to the best of my ability. And to do that, these are the accommodations, you know, that I need. I have, you know, documentation from my doctor regarding, you know, what my uh, disability is, what the condition is, and what those accommodations look like. And so, and one of the I don't want to say one of the aspects of the legal as the legal aspects of it is that it has to be a reasonable accommodation for the organization. And sometimes that's kind of how organizations get around uh, providing the accommodation because they categorize it as unreasonable. And so it's really just working with the organization to or the company to, you know, okay, what what are the accommodations that you can provide? The, these are the accommodations that I need. And if they can't, as opposed to saying, no, we can't do this, you know, you either work in this environment or not, or, you know, it's just developing um, a partnership with the HR department and trying to uh, 
create the best working environment for the individual with a disability? I hope that answers your question. Did that answer the question? I have one more uh, <laughs> question to tag along with that, which is okay. for our students, I know that sal they can negotiate their salary, for example, mm -hmm. but I'm wondering about um, if part of their, like, let's say they're, they're looking for jobs, um, if part of their interview process should be to go to HR and ask them, ask them which accommodations, you know, if, if they can have a confidential meeting with HR, first of all, so that mm -hmm. it doesn't impact their interview process, but but just see what accommodations might be on the table right out of the gate. Because I was just wondering, it just seems like that might be helpful um, for mm -hmm. students to get their best fit. Right. Well, and that that is that's a good approach, you know, to have a conversation with HR. But the a challenge with that may be. Um, if you have an HR person that doesn't understand the nature of disabilities, they may not, you know, let's say if this individual says, you know, I, I suffer from depression, that's an invisible disability, I suffer from depression. And that means that, you know, from my perspective, my experience, sometimes these individuals, um, they have struggles with getting out of the bed in the morning, you know, um, or they have str struggles with interacting with people or some days they just are unmotivated. Now for the person in HR, they may not have an understanding of what that disability is. They may not have an understanding of what, and what those accommodations would look like in the workplace. And so what you risk is, is that, you know, you go and say, well, what accommodations do you have? This is the disability that I have. What accommodations can you provide? It is, um, it's, it's, it may be challenging for them to really communicate ways that they can accommodate you. And, it's, it's probably a lot easier for, you know, let's say the doctor who has experiences uh, with uh, providing those accommodations or, you know, as you mentioned, as you're working to help place them in certain roles, you know, if you have experience with certain impairments, okay, you know, well, this is the impairment that you have and this is generally, you know, what those limitations may look like. It, it may not be exact, but, you know, but you can just help guide them in those situations uh, so that they are able to um, have the best working environment. But I, I would say I probably wouldn't solely rely on the HR department of the organization. And that's just from an, an information perspective because uh, the development regarding, and it, of course, like I said, it's legal and we know what those minimal uh, requirements are, but just beyond that, sometimes it is a challenge uh, for HR departments if they don't have uh, specific staff or personnel that's dedicated to uh, disability or understanding disability. And then Rebecca has her hand raised. Uh, thanks, Dr. Bennett, for, for being with us here this morning. I, I feel like maybe you've already uh, kind of answered this. Um, the, I think the answer is it's a work in progress, but I, I did want to kind of just uh, see if you had, I guess, any any additional tips. Um, in my in my current role, um, I work with others in, in the classroom quite a bit, and um, want to know if you had any kind of tips for working with others that that could be somewhat resistant to making accommodations, unless someone specifically comes forward saying, "I need this accommodation." Mm -hmm. um, and and for an example. In the classrooms, furniture gets moved around often, um, and it's, it's how much furniture can we get into the classroom? And you know, I'll kind of walk in and go, you know, anyone with any kind of limited mobility is not going to be able to even get in here well. And and often I'm I will get the answer, well, we don't have anybody in a wheelchair, so you know, unless we do, that's not really a concern. And and it, it does cause some friction, obviously, because I'm kind of advocating, hey, you know this should just be standard practice, right? To, to make these considerations. Uh, and so not only are the furniture, but I'm, I'm in kind of the technology area. And that's always a, a conversation also when we're putting in technology, are we thinking about speaker placement and you know, uh, how can we provide some of these 
uh, accommodations up front without someone coming in and, and saying, hey, I, I can't hear and I need something moved. Um, so I guess my question is, do you have any kind of tips for, I guess, working with you know other professionals that, that are just kind of resistant to thinking about this up front and, and putting things in place before someone has to come, you know, come forward, you know, require an accommodation. Right. I do. <laughs> now, one of, <clears throat> excuse me, but one of the approaches that I have, I, my first, uh, my first step is to have a conversation about, um, you know, the importance and the impact. So the, the importance of making these considerations and the impact when you don't make these uh, considerations. And this is really just helping them to, you know, understand while you may not, you know, see this, these are, uh, these are considerations that can negatively impact. Uh, and I always look at how, how things can negatively impact people or how it can negatively impact individuals, employees. But I look at how we can negatively and express that. Now, <laughs> that I, um, I don't want to say that <clears throat> I, um, I don't always bring out the legal aspects of it, but I will if I have to. Uh, and this is because it, it's a serious matter to me. And if legally you are not providing the minimum requirements, the minimum, minimum considerations, then your organization is at risk. So that looks at the broader picture of it. Now, you know, um, let's say, you know, as you mentioned in the classroom, the desk placement, an individual, you know, uh, with an assistive device, they may not be a mobility assistive device. They may not be able to navigate through this. Now that's a concern. That's a legal concern for the organization because if, if you have a student who, um, and whether you see them or not, if you have a student and you are, it's, it's more difficult for them to navigate the space because those accommodations are not being made, then legally, uh, the organization is responsible for that. And like I said, it's not to, um, it's not to just call out the legal aspects of it, but that it's a serious matter. That's how serious it is because you are putting your organization at risk. You're putting your, your job at risk when you don't make the necessary consideration, the necessary accommodations for individuals with disabilities. And so that's kind of, that's the, the, the second, actually last step in the legal aspects of it. And I, I hate to say that usually works, but I am a, I'm a policy person. And I always, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll pre present the, the rational aspects of it first, but then I say, hey, okay, well, let's take a look at uh, what our legal responsibilities are here. And that, that usually is able to, and, you know, and it's, I think that, of course, you want to build a cohesive uh, work environment, a, um, a good work environment with your coworkers. So it's about you know how you present that information as well because you don't want to present it in a manner that is offensive, uh, you know that comes across as condescending or any of that. But you know just having that conversation about what our responsibilities are. Thank you, Dr. Benna. No problem. You're welcome. Any more questions? comments? If not, I think we can end. I did put the link for the survey in the chat window. So please take a moment to do it. It only takes literally one, maybe even two minutes at the most, depending on how much you decide to write. Um, but we appreciate you attending this morning's session. Our next session will begin at 1045. Um, and the link was sent out in the email. So I look forward to seeing everyone there. And if there are no more questions, we'll go ahead and end this session. Thank you guys for having me. I really enjoyed it. I certainly, I, um, I think my contact, I posted my contact information on the first slide, but if you have any more questions, need any additional clarifications, any way that I can be of assistance, certainly let me know. Uh, I, like I said, I don't mind talking about it, sharing, uh, whatever way that I can help, just let me know. I appreciate it. And if there are no more questions, we'll end. Um, thank you, Dr. Bennett. Um, so much information. Uh, one more question, I see. 
Oh, applause. Um, thank you. Uh, so much information. I'm sure there is more you could have told us. I'm sure people may have questions afterwards and I will find a way to get them your contact information. But thank you for doing this this morning. You are welcome. I enjoyed it. <laughs> okay. Everyone, we'll see you again at um, 1045 and get some water, get some coffee, stand up and walk around. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.